All right, well, at this time, our kids are going to head out to kids' worship. Uh, we had a great first week of kids' worship last week. And so, uh, just a reminder that if you do have kids that are going back right now, uh, you, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, create some new policies and stuff. And so, one of the things that we're going to do uh, is the kids will be staying back there in kids' worship uh, at the conclusion of our service. So, you'll need to actually go back there and get them. That way we're not just releasing kids to run rampant wherever uh, through the parking lot and everything is dismissing. So uh, they'll be back there. Just go through these double doors uh, and you'll be able to pick your kids up uh, in the other building. So, uh, well, with that being said, the rest of us are going to be continuing our time studying through the book of Haggai. We are on this uh, quick little journey. It's only three weeks, but we are walking through this book of Haggai, and if you need a, some help finding it, you can, as we said last week, you can go to the table of contents, or you can start in the book of Matthew there at the end of the New Testament, or at the beginning of the New Testament, and turn back a few chapters to the minor prophets, and you will eventually find this short little two-chapter book of Haggai. One of the things that we said last week is that even though this book is short, it doesn't mean that it's not significant. In fact, one of the things that we're going to see and some of the things that we're going to see is that the words that Haggai is prophesying are extremely applicable and important for us today. This book takes place over just a four-month period between what would be our modern calendar's days of August 29th through December 18th. And during that time, God is going to send a series of four messages to his people through the prophet Haggai. Now, the reasoning behind God sending this message is that God was seeing some things taking place in that day that were not good. What he was seeing was that the people had just recently returned from exile. And we talked last week a little bit about what that meant to be in exile, that literally they had been away from their homeland for 70 years living in Babylon. And so now they've returned back to their homeland, and it's been about 15 years. And they've begun to kind of reform their life and reset their life and restructure their life. They've built houses for themselves. And yet the temple, the house of God, the place that literally represented the presence of God among His people, still laid in ruins. And the people have a mindset and a heart that's saying, well, it's just not time for that yet. And God, through the prophet Haggai, sends His first message where He condemns them to some extent because they're saying it's not yet time and yet they're spending all of their time and their energy and their efforts not just building houses, but building luxury. And focusing their intention on how can they satisfy their own desires? How can they live comfortably in their own setting versus prioritizing the things of God? And the problem was that because of their lack of priority, pri prioritizing the things of God, they were experiencing hardships in their day-to-day -day lives. They were working and working and working. And at the end of the day, it didn't seem like there was a lot of fruitfulness coming out of that. We even talked last week about what it is to, to you know, we, we quoted that passage from Jeremiah where it talks about that we have dug cisterns that will not hold water. And about how so many times we can become guilty of that very thing where we can become busy and yet we don't see a lot of great produce or fruit from that busyness because we're prioritizing the wrong things. Maybe we're focusing on our own desires, our own wants, but ultimately... It's not glorifying God and we don't see the fruit that can come from it when we live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And so God, there at the beginning uh, of Haggai chapter 1, calls the people to consider their ways. Think about what you're doing. Think about the lives that you're living and ask yourselves, is this working? 
And as the people heard this message, it tells us there at the end of chapter 1 that they took this to heart and they were motivated and spurred to actually begin working on the temple, to begin constructing and doing exactly what God had called them to do. So as we get to chapter 2 that we're going to be looking at this morning, we find ourselves about a month later. So the people of God have been working for about a month now on the temple, getting the foundation set up, getting all the stones ready, getting everything just how it needs to be so they can begin this construction. And as they get ready to dedicate the site, as they get ready to see what God is going to do there, something's going to happen that's going to dishearten them. And as we think about that this morning... I want us to think about this. There are going to be times in our lives, and specifically here in our walk with Christ, when we are going to be tempted to give up or to get discouraged. There are going to be times when we're tempted to think, am I really making a difference in the things that I do? And kind of that key point, that main idea that I want us to keep underneath everything that we're going to be talking about here today is this. That even when our work for Him, for God, seems insignificant, it is in those moments that God calls us to press on. Let's look here together, beginning in verse 1. In the, second year, or in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnants of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts. Let's pray as we begin our time together this morning. Father God, as we open up your word, God, my prayer is that you would speak not only to our minds, God. I don't want us to just be informed. God, I pray that your word would transform us. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that, Lord, if, there would, if, if there's sin there, that you would convict us, Lord. If there's a place that we need to be motivated or a, ser- a, a way that we need to be serving God that we're not, I pray that you would move us to do that this day. God, as we hear these words and read your word, Lord, I believe that your word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, able, able to divide to the very joint and marrow of God, able to pierce our very hearts and souls. And so, God, I pray now, God, that you would speak through your word into the hearts and lives of your people, God, that they may be raised up to walk in faithfulness and truth with you. God, use your people. Use your word in the lives of your people to accomplish great things. So God, we pray these things in your name. Amen. So even when our work for Him seems insignificant, God is calling us to press on. As we see here, beginning in verse 1, it tells us, 
On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnants of the people, and ask them, Who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? So here it is, the 21st day of the seventh month. And the word of God comes through the prophet Haggai. And the message is this. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Basically, as he calls the people together, he asks this question. Show your hands which of you remembers what Solomon's temple looked like. At this point, Solomon's temple would have been torn down some 85 years ago. It would have been looted and destroyed when the Babylonians came in and took over. And so only the very old would have known and been able to have seen as children what Solomon's temple looked like in its former glory. But there obviously were a few that would have remembered what it was like. And he asked this question, how do you see it now? You may say, well, wait a second, the whole temple's not been rebuilt yet. I mean, it's still basically a pile of rubble. It's just a foundation that they've cleared. It's just the initial stages of getting everything ready that they can even begin to see. Well, that's, that's true. But even when the foundations were laid, not to mention that they knew the resources they had. I mean, at the time that Solomon's temple was built, it was at the highlight of Israel's wealth and prosperity. It was a time that was so wealthy that 1 Kings 10, 27 says that silver was as common as stone in that day. It was a time of great abundance and prosperity in the land of Israel. And Solomon used all of this wealth, all of this prosperity, all of these resources in order to build one of the most glorious structures ever known to mankind in the first temple. And so here the people are, 15 years after being in exile. There's still rubble all around the city. The temple is not there at the moment. It's just a foundation. There's very little silver and gold and resources. In fact, from what we've seen in the first chapter, they're in the midst of a drought where much of their livelihood has been spent just getting by from day to day. And so here they are, looking at their resources, looking at the foundation that's still not quite finished and ready. And they know something in their hearts. There is no way that this building is ever going to be as glorious as what we lost. It's why Haggai continues after asking that question. Who remembers what this once looked like? And he says th these words. Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Feel the weight of this statement. Is it not as nothing in your eyes? See, the former glory of Solomon's temple was so spectacular that for those that had seen it, it almost seemed like what was in front of them now was absolutely worthless. It was nothing to them. And they may have asked themselves, how could this be? You see, what happened as they began to rebuild it, we get a picture of these events of what's going to take place in Ezra chapter 3. And in Ezra chapter 3, which deals with a larger picture of the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem there, it provides us some immediate background to what's happening here in Haggai chapter 2. And so it tells us there in Ezra chapter 3, it says, Now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, so this is two years later, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, made a beginning. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, 
The priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the direction of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. I mean, this is an incredibly amazing scene. The people of Israel have gathered together. The foundation has been laid and there's bands and there's singing and there's dancing and the music is being played and there is this great sense of excitement because progress is being made on the house of the Lord and they can't wait for the day when they can worship again at the temple. So there's this shouting and rejoicing. There are trumpets. There's all of this going on. But then we get to verse 12 of Ezra chapter 3. And it tells us this, but, but many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout and the sound was heard far and why? Wow. In the midst of all of this celebration, the older men had tears streaming down their faces, sobbing because they knew of better days. They knew of a time when they had had more, when there was an abundance. And it says that they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid. This is an intense moment. I mean, can you imagine being a child walking the streets of Jerusalem that day? Your parents are shouting for joy. They're singing songs with their friends. It's a day that seems like the, it's the greatest day of all. And yet, wait a second, here are my grandparents. They're not shouting, they're weeping. To them, this doesn't seem like the greatest of days. It seems like a day of mourning, of sadness. And Ezra says that it was so powerful that if you were there, you would have been unable in that moment to have distinguished from the rejoicing from the weeping. The sound of tears of joy from the sound of tears of sorrow. You see, if we aren't... There's some things here that I think we need to notice. See, God had promised through the prophet Ezekiel. See, one of the things that I think we see here, and we have to ask ourselves, is why is it that the people are responding in this way? Why is it that the people, especially the older generation here, is responding in the way that they are when they see this temple? And I believe the reason why is because they had longed for something better. It did not match up with their past experiences, but there's something else going on here because their response is so strong. There's this idea that they were expecting something more than what they're seeing. You see, what happened is that God had promised through the prophet Ezekiel in chapters 40 through 48, during the days of exile, that a future temple would be constructed that would surpass all the glory of Solomon's temple. That there was going to be a day and a time when they would return to their land and as God reconstructed His temple, that this temple was going to hold even a greater honor and greater distinction among the people. After all, this temple represented the very presence of God among them. It was their central place of worship. But as they look at this foundation, and as they look at their resources, something becomes abundantly clear to them that what they are about to rebuild would never be as glorious as what they had seemed to lost. This discouragement over this realization led them to either slow down or potentially even completely stop working altogether. So it's at this point that Haggai, like any good representative of God, identifies with them in their pain and their brokenness. He, he, he calls attention to it in order to show them that, yes, I understand that this is not what it once was. He says, I know this seems in the moment like it's going to be insignificant. But he reminds them, 
Don't lose heart. And don't lose perspective of what you're doing. There are two reasons why, two arguments for why they should not give up in this moment. The first is this. You should work because I am with you. You should work because I am with you. That's that first point there. He tells us in verse 4. But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. First thing it says there in verse 4 is, but now. Which means it shows us there's a clear transition here. It's like he's pointed out and shown, yes, it's not what you hoped for. Yes, there's some sorrow there, and I understand that. But now, it's time to move forward. See, I think sometimes we can get so caught up, and I think there's a warning here for us. There are times when we can get so caught up on the glory of the past that we forget or miss the present work that God is doing in the now. And so it's important that we remember the past, but that we are faithful in the present. And he tells them here, but now I have a message for you. And he calls attention to three different groups. To Zerubbabel, the political leader. To Joshua, the religious leader. And just in case, to all the people so that all might hear. And the message is this, be strong. See, the task before them was enormous. Rebuild a temple. It's a big job. And you're going to do this with limited resources, in the middle of a drought, when you're discouraged. I get it. It's hard. And so he tells them, be strong. Church, sometimes this is the message that we need to hear. See, so many times we live in a world today that loves to have the feel good, but doesn't like to hear the hard words. We love to hear the, hey, it's going to be okay, baby, it's okay, mama's going to take care of you. We love to hear, we live in such a, a sanitized culture that don't ever raise your voice and no one should ever get their feelings hurt or be disappointed or, you know, it's, it's an everybody gets a trophy type generation. I mean, channel my inner Joel Osteen here. If you believe it, you can achieve it. That's not in the Bible. You see, here, at this time, at this moment in Israel's history, in Judah's history, every person knows hard times are going to lie ahead. Resistance is coming. There are going to be seasons when life will push back at us and it is going to be hard to press on. And in those moments when trials and troubles come, you may be tempted to give up or to go the other way. And in those moments, the words that God is saying to us are the very moments that Haggai, or the very words that Haggai is saying to the people of Israel, be strong, press on. I know some of you are discouraged. I know some of you are disappointed. But three times here, God tells them here, be strong. Don't quit. Don't give up. Because God has a different plan for you. See, this is not just a moral command of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Why? The reason is found in verse 4. Be strong, declares the Lord. Work. Why? For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 5 tells us that this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. He tells them, that this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. See, in Exodus 29, verse 45, it tells us 
God speaking to his people there in the wilderness tells them that I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God. And we saw last week that God had given them a a forward message to help them begin that project of rebuilding the temple. And that forward message was, I am with you. And not only is he with us, but he even goes as far as to identify himself and say that I am with you declares The Lord of hosts. This title of the Lord of hosts appears over and over and over again throughout the book of Haggai. In fact, in just these two chapters alone, 14 times in the book of Haggai, we see God described as the Lord of hosts. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to realize, okay, this must have some kind of significance. See, what the Lord of hosts refers to is it refers to God as the leader of all the heavenly and earthly armies. That it's a picture of triumph and greatness and strength. That God and God alone is the supreme power and authority in all of the universe. And so in light of that, we might look and say, no matter what comes against us, No matter what stands in opposition to us, we can be strong and we can press on and we can fulfill what God has called us to fulfill. Why? Because He is with us. So we must work and we should work because God is with us. Secondly, we must work because we build more than we can see. We must work Because we build more than we can see. Verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. The writer of Hebrews is going to quote this passage in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 26 and 27. And there as the writer of Hebrews is quoting this he says that at that time his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, it indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Like you guys have seen like the little pans where they, sh- where they shift or they uh, sift for gold. And the idea is that they would go down into the riverbed and they would shake it. And as they scooped up the sediment, they would shake it and the... Things that they didn't want would fall through and what would remain? The things that really matter. And what God is telling us here is that there is going to come a time and a season where God is going to shake literally the heavens and the earth. And all of those temporary things, all of those earthly things, all of those non-eternal things are going to be done away with. They're going to be sifted. They're going to fall through so that... He says in verse 7, that I will shake all the nations and what is desired by all the nations, what is treasured by all the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. See, understand that what he's pointing to in that day, that he will shake the nations and all the things of the earth will pass away. And in that day, he will fill this house with glory. He's pointing to something beyond just the reality that Israel would see in that day. He's pointing to something beyond just that earthly temple that was before them. He's pointing to something that's not even happened yet, and yet we see described in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he says, And I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city had no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. He's reminding them that there was a glorious future yet to come that they had not even imagined. And he tells them here in verse 8, just as a reminder, The silver is mine. 
and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. You see, their concern was that the temple was not going to be as adorned with silver and gold as Solomon's had been. It wasn't going to be as pretty or attractive as it had once been. And yet God is reminding them here that ultimately He is the one in utter control over all the details. That He is the one that owns the cattle on the thousand hills. That all the silver is His. And all the gold is His. That any resources you have are given to you by the grace of God. That He is the one ultimately in control. And so if God in that moment desired to rain down gold and silver from heaven on them, He could have done so. And it was within His power because He is God Almighty. So He reminds them here. But there is something greater coming. And he tells them in verse 9, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, and I think this is the key in understanding what he's talking about. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. See, to get the full meaning of this, we have to understand a little bit about the Hebrew word shalom, which is translated oftentimes as peace. Because he tells us here that in this place I will grant peace. You see, the Hebrew word shalom is so much more than just the absence of conflict. It is not just an absence of war or hostility, but instead it is a return to intended purpose, a restoration or a restoring of hope. And so obviously here, he's not talking about the literal building here because there was not a soul who would have ever looked at that building and the grandness of the first temple in comparison and said, wow, this second temple is going to be greater. So what is he pointing us to here? Just as the temple was a place that sin was atoned for, God is promising here that a greater temple would be yet to come in order to atone for sin. One through which peace would come for His people. And in this moment, we begin to hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 2. Where Jesus tells them, after having cleansed this very temple that they're standing in and looking at, He states, So the Jews said to Him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures. What scripture? Haggai 2, verse 9. And they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken to them. You see, God is promising them that there is going to come a day. Yes, we look at this and we think, wow, this isn't maybe what I wanted. This isn't what it once was. And yet, there's something greater that God is working. There's a greater hope and a greater peace. And that is found in Jesus Christ. It's not found in earthly buildings. It's not found in structures. It is found in our relationship with God. And so I want to challenge you this morning. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, we've, just, we've already talked about it this morning. We're not guaranteed the next five minutes. We're not guaranteed another day. And so you better make sure that you have a relationship with God. Have you ever placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, the only one that can save? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The tendency is for us to find our joy and our peace and our prosperity in things other than God. And the problem is that those things never last. And yet even here in this story, we see God reminding His people that there is a greater hope and that is ultimately Jesus Christ, the true temple, the one that can bring true peace in our lives. So I don't know where you are this morning, but we're going to have a time of response. And if God's leading you to, don't ignore the calls of God on your heart. 
If God's moving in your heart saying, I think I need to give my life to Christ, you're at a moment of decision. Or you can be obedient and seek after God and live for Him and experience eternity in fellowship with Him. Or you can go your own way. Maybe some of you just need to come and pray. This altar is always open and available for those that need to cry out to God whose hearts are burdened. And God tells us some incredible things that He hears every cry of the afflicted. Maybe some of you want to come and join and be a part of the work that God is doing. God has been blessing us here at Ogden Baptist Church. We are in some exciting days here. So maybe some of you want to join with us and join us in the work that God is doing here as we seek to share the name of Jesus with our community and our world. However God leads you, be obedient to what He's called you to do. Let's pray.